right. So um, if you have any questions at all, again, this is about the snakes of Georgia and kind of 10 facts about why snakes are actually pretty cool creatures and we should respect them. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and put that in the chat box. I and mean, hopefully you will have questions. I really, really would encourage you uh, to think of some interesting, neat things. Uh, maybe you have some um, old wives tales that you've heard of. Maybe you think about, you know, snake repellents and do they work and that kind of thing. But I encourage you to really think hard and come up with some good questions about snakes. Um, most people are kind of scared of them and they don't want to talk about them or even think that they exist. But um, I'm here to hopefully, you know, get you all excited so that you can think about snakes a little bit more. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about snakes in Georgia specifically. There's 46 different species of snakes in Georgia, and that's 40 ven non-venomous. So the chances of you encountering a venomous snake in Georgia, especially around here in the Atlanta area, is pretty darn low that you're going to see something that could hurt you. Most um, areas of Georgia only have just a couple of the venomous snakes. I mean, that's that's Six different species are spread all across the entire state. Here in um, the Gwinnett County or in the Atlanta metro area, there may be some of you, let me see if some of you are from outside this area. Sometimes we get folks from uh, from far away. It looks like we don't have anybody here that I'm aware of today that's uh, from a different state. But um, here you really only have the copperhead and that's the one that you're going to encounter most often. You might see an occasional cottonmouth, uh, water moccasin. Um, very occasionally on the outer edges, you might uh, see, you know, a rattlesnake, but probably not. Most of those are going to be up in the mountains or they're going to be down in and around Augusta and all the way over into the Alabama border and then down into the southern part of the state. Some people talk about the coral snake. We don't have that here. That's going to be in the southern part of the state. So just know that really here in Gwinnett County and in and around and Barrow in the metro area, it's probably only going to be the copperhead. Um, odds that you're going to encounter these guys, pretty slim. Even the non-venomous ones, they're more scared of you than you are of them. Um, so what I want you to kind of have as a takeaway is an appreciation for them, a little bit about how to keep them away from your house. We'll talk about that. And then being a little more confident and being able to tell the difference between a venomous and a non-venomous. And then I know everyone likes to say they're poisonous. They're not poisonous. It's actually venomous. So we'll move on. Oops. Okay. So some myths. Snakes chase you. That is a myth. They really are scared of you. Really, I swear, they are scared of you. So if you are out in your garden, minding your own business, and you see maybe a garter snake, maybe you catch sight of a black rat snake, um, you know, DK snake. I mean, some of these are really tiny little snakes. If you see one and you're scared of it, it is about a thousand times more scared of you. So just know that if you see one, even a venomous snake, they really want nothing to do with you. And their last course of action is to stand their ground and try to attack. So if you, they have any way of getting away, that's exactly where they're going to go. Another falsehood, if it's in or near water, it's a cottonmouth. Uh, you will see as we kind of go through, we'll look at distributions of some of these snakes. And that should assure you that you really don't have as much to worry about as you think you do. So if you're in or near water, mostly what you're going to see around the Atlanta metro area is going to be water snakes. Uh, there's a banded, there's a northern. They look kind of evil and mean, but honestly, they're not. Uh, they eat fish or small amphibians. They are not venomous. Uh, another falsehood, if you're near a snake, it's going to bite you. If it can't eat you, it really doesn't want to bite you either because it takes a lot of energy for a snake to produce any venom. And this is mostly for venomous snakes. Um, Non-venomous snakes, <clears throat> excuse me, may bite you. There's nothing injected in there. Um, you just have to kind of treat it as a bacterial type issue. But um, yeah, it takes a lot of energy for that snake to produce that venom. Um, some kind of 
trivia that's interesting. So as I mentioned, we do have copperheads here and we are moving into copperhead breeding season. So you might start seeing them on warmer days, sitting on concrete, uh, maybe you have a patio, maybe you have some stones or rocks um, in and around your property and they're sunning themselves. So they are inherently um, cold blooded. They don't have thermal regulation. So they need a warm area in which they can get that, that energy that they need from the sun to warm up, to move around. Um, Specifically with the copperhead and with some other types of younger snakes, they don't have the ability to um, regulate how much venom they release. So understand that, uh, especially with copperheads, when you start moving into that season, which would be you know, May, June, July-ish, summer, summer, be careful about reaching under bushes if you live in a really wooded area, be careful about reaching under there. We'll talk a little bit about safety. You do have to just be kind of aware. Uh, they don't mean to bite you, but if you stick your hand in their face and they can't get away fast enough, sometimes that's what can happen. So just understand that's the last thing they wanna do, but they will if they feel like they need to protect themselves. All right, so let's move into the benefits of snakes. I, I promised that I would talk about 10 things um, that would make you appreciate snakes more or 10 different things that are kind of interesting um, that you can go, huh, I didn't know that or I didn't really think about that. So snakes help control pest populations. Yeah, they do. So they're natural predators of rodents and insects and other small animals. And that doesn't necessarily mean in your home, they can be out and about and they're eating rats or mice or voles. Uh, you see a snake down there at the bottom, that's uh, a water snake, that guy is eating fish. Um, even cottonmouth water moccasins, that's what they eat. They're piscivorous, meaning that mostly eat fish. They'll also eat spiders. So they eat, you know, katydids and they eat cicadas. This coming year, we're supposed to have a bumper crop of cicadas. So if you see a lot more snakes out, it may be because of that. They're out there just taking advantage of the natural food source because there's supposed to be a lot of them. Um, mostly it's rodents though that we we get calls about and they say, people say, oh, I had a snake in my garage. How do I get them out? And um, they're probably there because of the rodents. And snakes, are really efficient at paring down rodent populations. So just know, and, and I'll talk about the uh, HURL model, which, you, you know, habitat modification and some other things, but just know that if they are there in your house, in your garage, in your attic, in your basement, wherever they are, they are there because there's a food source. So that food source, usually a rat or a mouse or something like that has gotten in and they have followed, they, they have a really excellent sense of smell. So they're there to eat the, the rodents that are there. And maybe, you know, they've pared down the population in, in that area enough that it's not caused a lot of destruction. So they can be helpful in that way. But if they scare you and you don't want them there, you'll have to remove the rodents. So snakes help disperse seeds and pollinate. How many people, and you just, you know, you can, if you if you know how to do the raise the hand function on here, you can do that. If not, you don't have to worry about it. But how many people actually knew that snakes were pollinators? A lot of people, probably not. Uh, they actually do, some of the smaller snakes will crawl across. You can see there's a picture of one there uh, crawling across a, a daisy. And just like beetles, which sometimes are inadvertent pollinators, they're mostly inadvertent pollinators. But if they're crawling around across a flower or something like that, they sure can be pollinators. Uh, they also are great at dispersing seeds, just like birds. They're going to eat that fruit. They're um, pretty opportunistic and they'll get whatever happens to be around for them to eat. They'll eat fruits and then disperse it just like birds will. So just like uh, some of these uh, species, of, I don't even know what that is. Like a, it looks like a grape or something like that. Um, but that ensures the survival of that particular plant species. So, you know, obviously you don't want them to be too successful that would become invasive but yeah they're uh, they're definitely pollinators and they definitely spread seeds and um, I bet that's probably something that nobody really knew or thought about 
Moving on, so snakes do provide food for other animals. Um, you can see here 10 animals that prey on snakes. So some people think mistakenly or, you know, maybe not so mistakenly that um, snakes are uh, top apex predators and they're not, they are not apex predators. So they're actually somewhere in the middle of the pack. You can see here, some snakes are actually food for other snakes. You can see a king snake. Um, sometimes you'll get king snakes, they'll eat copperheads. You got birds and bobcats. You've got mongoose, the mongoose and wolverines. I mean, not all of these are in Georgia, obviously, but these are all animals that will eat snakes. Um, and then of course, snakes will also eat all sorts of other predators, amphibians, insects, as I mentioned before. So they're kind of in the middle of the pack, but that makes them extra important. So that's one reason why we need to be um, appreciative of them. And I'll move into why we should appreciate them a little bit more um, when I have another visual. So they're very important indicators of environmental health. Their presence or absence can tell us a lot about the environment that they're in. They're pretty sensitive to temperature and humidity and some of the other factors. So if you should see a snake living, a particular species of snake living there, and it's not there, that might be an indication there's a problem. Um, so natural predation. So you may see through changes in the food chain. I mentioned that they're kind of in the middle of the pack. They're not an apex predator. So suddenly if you have let's say the apex predator that was feeding on them is now gone, you might see a population increase. And then because you see a population increase of snakes, you might see a decrease in the population of rodents or insects or something else. Uh, so that can tell you there's a problem. Habitat loss could be natural or human driven, uh, You know, can decrease the number of snakes. Poaching, there's a lot of problem with the pet trade. Um, or skins, I mean, it, it really depends, but um, there is a big problem with the pet trade. You have a lot of people going out and removing them from the wild and then selling them on the illegal pet trade or food or trophy hunting. Um, you know, those are probably less of an issue. Pollution, human activity can totally destroy a snake's habitat. Conversely, um, you know, human interaction can make particular parts of habitat uh, much more favorable and, you know, releasing snakes into that habitat can be a problem. Just let's ask Florida. Florida has all sorts of issues and pythons and, and other snakes that you should only find in a rainforest situation or in a tropical situation are a really big problem there. Um, and then of course, pest status. Humans often rank snakes as pets, pests and they will hunt and kill them. And that's what I'm trying to kind of help with education here. I want everyone to understand and appreciate the snakes that we have here. We don't have anything really like um, huge pythons or anacondas here. Um, now down in Florida, that's another matter, but um, we really don't have those here. So um, occasionally you'll hear that something got out, some family pet got out and uh, during the summertime, but you just know that most of those types of snakes can't really survive here over winter. It's generally too cold for them. So they're usually not an issue. So more benefits, snakes have medicinal properties. I think we kind of already know that probably most of us do just as a matter of course, but they're both used as a symbol and you can see that that's the symbol for medicine, uh, kind of the universal symbol of medicine. And it's a symbol because it's of a ability to shed its skin, which kind of represents that life and rebirth, um, renewal and fertility. It is also kind of connected to an ancient Greek god of healing, which that staff is the common medical emblem that, that we see and kind of associated with he healing, wisdom, knowledge. And all of those are, are definitely necessary in medicine. So um, that's one of the reasons why it has uh, medicinal properties. Besides that though, the venom from snakes, different types of snakes can be used to treat heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, and there are all sorts of other medical conditions. I don't have enough space to list them all here. And they've also are using that 
in research to treat brain injuries and strokes, Alzheimer's disease, heart attacks, blood disorders, breast cancer, and Parkinson's disease, among others. So there are a lot of really good qualities here, medicinal qualities, uh, both in the symbolic and in the, the practical measure. Oops. Benefits of snakes. Snakes are popular for ecotourists and um, I, I, some of you might be going, oh no, she's put a little girl on, on this, uh, this page. Rest easy. This is actually my daughter, Keelan, when she was about nine. And, uh, Keelan is pretty fearless. She's, uh, she's a freshman at UGA right now, and she's majoring in animal science when wants to be a veterinarian. So this picture here doesn't come as much surprise to me. We were on a cruise and, she saw the snake and wanted a picture taken. And so we did that. Uh, the interesting thing about this is this is not actually the first picture I have of her where she's doing this. We went on another cruise when she was three and the same instance saw the snake really wanted a picture. Uh, I can't find that picture though. I need to go find that, but she was three and she has the snake wrapped around her. So they're popular for ecotourism. In this case, it's just a guy on the side of the road that has a snake and people stop and pay him a couple bucks and get a picture. But um, people will pay a lot of money to see that particular snake in its natural habitat. So that's something actually that's a good thing in some ways, as long as it's manageable and um, you can promote that sustainable type of tourism so that you can help raise awareness about what's going on in and around their habitat. So you you can, it, it's a fine line. You just have to kind of walk that fine line. Snakes maintaining the balance in the ecosystem. So I've mentioned before, they're kind of in the middle. Those they're con considered mesopredators. So they're not at the top. A top would be an apex predator. They're not down at the bottom. They're just kind of in the middle. So we look at this and I've got a little picture of a food web here. It's very complex. There's a lot of different interactions. You can see there that owl might eat that frog. The snake might eat the frog. That owl might eat that snake. The bird might eat the snake. I mean, it, there's just, that's why it's called a web because it's very connected, interconnected and snakes are smack in the middle of all of that. So as I mentioned, having them in the middle like that means that Sometimes you, you know, they're a very good indicator for a problem in the environment because they can show, um, you know, like an increase in the population or decrease in the population pretty easily. And that's very visible. Obviously, you might notice if there were a lot of extra snakes in your garage. So, yes, um, they are a really good and important part of that biodiversity that's out there in that, that food web or that food chain. Um, so that's one reason why we need to not kill them when we see them. I always say spray away. And again, we'll talk a little bit about methods of getting them to shoo versus killing them. So snakes and cultural significance, um, you know, without having to really go through and read all of this, you can kind of, the takeaway here is transformation and rebirth, royal power and protection in Egypt and Greek mythology, wisdom and knowledge, uh, both like with the medical uh, community and healing, death and evil, the, the Bible and the serpent tempting to eat the fruit. Uh, and then, you know, again, healing and medicine. So they are interwoven in our history, our human history, you know, eons and eons. So um, they are, because they're so interwoven, and you can see there in my little background, I've got some snakes. We want to respect them for what they are and how they are in our environment. Scientific research. So, you know, we can study them and just like we do other animals too for physiology, behavior, and genetics. We can use them as a model for a large range of biological processes. So um, I like this cute little guy. So I put him on here, but you know, looking at biodiversity and evolution, it gives us all sorts of really interesting factoids and things that we can use today to kind of compare. They've been around for a really long time. Reptiles are, I mean, you know, like crocodiles, for instance, seeing them, a different type is obviously not a snake, but seeing them uh, and how little they've evolved over time 
it, it is interesting to kind of see where snakes were and where they are today and how they've adapted um, to environments as we have them now. Education and appreciation. So I wanted to throw a little bit of whimsy in here. So I put some snakes and hats. Yes, those are actually real pictures of snakes and hats. People do make hats for snakes and then take pictures with them. So education and appreciation. You know, one of the things that we do and 4-H also does when they're working with kids is trying to, to get the kids and here I am trying to help with adults to learn the role of snakes in the ecosystem and how they're predators and they eat the rodents and the insects and other things and how that's a good thing because that kind of knocks down the number of pests out there, makes it a little easier. So when we think about uh, IPM or integrated pest management, one of the things that we look at are biological controls. IPM is not just for bugs. We use it a lot for bugs, but we can also use it for disease and nuisance animals. So snakes are pretty a pretty useful thing to have if you have a large rodent population. For instance, if you're a farmer in the Midwest and you have grain, one of the things that can, um, in addition to loss from say fungal organisms or something like that would be rodents. So if you have a large population of snakes on your farm, that's probably an advantage to you because those snakes will then eat those rodents. Uh, some common mis misconceptions you know, we want really to, to kind of eliminate some of those. We want folks to understand, and, and again, I repeat a lot of times, but that's because I want you to remember that they are really important in our environment and they do eat the rodents and they do eat the insects that bother us, the grasshoppers that maybe are munching on our, our garden and our leaves. Uh, the, the rats that might be living in our attic, that kind of thing. So they're keeping the populations of pests down and that's very important. Uh, and then economic impact of snake conservation. So, um, you know, when you keep their populations at a decent amount and they can eat those rodents, that helps eliminate the need for some of the pesticides. So again, the IPM approach in, um, is, which is a more holistic approach to utilizing nature and everything around nature so that we don't have to tap into the, the pesticides to control. So I gave you the 10 reasons why snakes were awesome. So now we're gonna dive into a little bit of snake behavior. We'll learn a little bit about what makes them tick. So hopefully you can understand and not be as afraid of them when you see them. Uh, so when they see a human, let's say you're just walking along in your backyard and you see a snake and you're like, Oh man, there's a snake there. So what is that snake going to do? Well, it depends a little bit on its method of uh, whether it's venomous or not venomous and what kind of camouflage it, ha it has. So first of all, it's going to try not to be seen. It might freeze. It's not going to move. It's just going to sit there for a second. So I have a picture here of a copperhead. This isn't, you can tell where the copperhead is. But there are some pictures where you see and, and that circulate the internet and people ask, try to find that copperhead. And it's actually pretty challenging. These guys blend in really well. I can show you um, some pictures later and you'll see, how, you, you know, exactly how they blend in. But for here, you can see there's just there's a copperhead sitting there. So they try not to be seen. They freeze. They don't move. And you know, they hope that you'll just pass them on by. That's what they want to do. Next on down the line, if they are seen and confronted, they're going to try to escape. So they're going to get mad a little bit, but they just really want to get the heck out of Dodge. So if they can, and there is an exit path, they're going to make it and they're going to move fast. So one of the snakes we see most often around our houses uh, and maybe even in our attics and garages, a black rat snake. So those are, are pretty common. They don't seem to mind human structures. Sometimes we get them hanging out uh, in the, the rafters in a barn. Sometimes we get them on our porch and they'll kind of curl around if you have posts. Um, they might crawl into the garage and they might crawl up into the garage door and hang out there, but they don't mind humans so much. They have learned over time that rodents tend to hang around where humans are. 
because you have dog food in the garage or bird seed or something like that. And that attracts mice. So um, they will tend to hang around there. And if they've got a way out and they don't have to deal with you, they will take that way out. So they will bug out of there. If they can't escape, because let you know maybe they're in the back of the garage or there just is no escape they're on a rock and there's nothing be, you know no way for them to go they'd have to go at you then they might have a threatening display now that depends a lot on what species of snake you're talking about so in this case you can see here at the eastern hognose snake he looks dead doesn't he he's not that's what he does he plays dead so he will flip himself over and give you this really dramatic display of, I'm dead, leave me alone. Uh, he'll have a gaping mouth and he makes his body look kind of big and flat. And he might even rattle his tail a little bit to mimic a rattlesnake. And then of course you have the rattlesnake and that's a classic gesture. When everybody thinks of a threatened snake, they're gonna think of that rattlesnake where they coil up and they get that tail out and they start rattling. Well, that's a good indication. You better back off because he's probably gonna strike. He doesn't want to, if you remember right, to a couple back where I said, that takes a lot of energy to create that venom. He wants that venom so that he can eat because when he, bites that mouse, he's going to inject that venom so that he can uh, kill that mouse, basically, or, or paralyze that mouse. He doesn't want to waste that on you. It took a lot of, of metabolic energy to create that venom. So he would much rather use that rattle and say, hey, back off. You know, I don't have anywhere to go. And, you know, I don't want you anywhere near me. That's his way of telling you that. So just respect that. Uh, what you can do if you do run across that, you can spray a snake away. That's one thing that that I definitely recommend. If you have a venomous snake, whether it's a copperhead, water moccasin, or maybe you've got a place up in the mountains or down in uh, central or southern Georgia, you can spray a snake away. So get your water hose. If it is someplace where you don't want it to be, don't kill it. Okay, get that hose and just start spraying it. That will disarm the behavior, short circuit that behavior, move off to the side, give it a way to get away and spray that snake and it will take off. It'll leave. Uh, I guarantee you, it's not going to come after you as long as you give it a way to get away. So, um, and then if all else fails, they actually strike at you if they don't have a way to escape. And that can be a, a non-venomous snake as well. A lot of them will pretend they'll mimic so that they can actually look like a really scary venomous snake and make you jump back and run away. They don't want to be harassed. So they're just trying to get away. Avoiding negative interactions. So things you can do, let's say you like to go hiking. Well, snakes feel those vibrations of your footfalls on the path the crunching of the leaves, the other things like that. They can sense that. So they know you're there before you know they're there. And if they have the opportunity, they're either going to be really quiet and they're not going to move like this guy here under the rock, or they're going to bug out of there before you even get a, get there. A lot of times what happens is you're on a bike, maybe you're running the trail, maybe you're on a horse, and you have a snake that's caught midway trying to pass over that trail. You've just caught him. He was kind of unaware. He was moving, minding his own business. Now you're there and he's scared. He's probably going to keep going. You might be really scared, but he's, he's more scared of you. So just be careful when you're walking along a trail and try to, you know, look out ahead to make sure that you're doing you know, you're best at identifying that there's no snakes out there. Always look where you're putting your hands or feet. So with gardening, always, 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 if you are in copperhead, young copperhead season, so early spring, well, late spring, early summer, always poke around under a bush first, especially if it's, you know, there's a lot of um, leaf litter or other things under there and you have a lot of trees and very wooded yard, poke around under the bush with a stick first or um, you can get those uh, grabber handled things, uh, something like that, something that you can stick underneath there first that's not your hand because you don't want to come in contact with any of those young copperheads. I have a family friend who lives up in Raven County and he was out 
uh, pruning his bushes in June, I believe. It's been several years now. But he reached underneath a bush to grab, you know, something, you know, piece of branch that had fallen down. And he got bitten by quite a few young copperheads that were underneath there. There was a nest. It took 15 vials of antivenom. 15 vials. Each of those vials of antivenom is ridiculously expensive. OK, so you don't want to do that. And he was very uncomfortable for quite a period of time. He survived. Uh, but those young snakes don't have the ability to regulate the amount of venom they pump into you. So they're just unleashing their entire load. So it's very important that if you're going to be gardening where you have copperheads or any other venomous snake, always, always, always know where your hands and feet are going if you're going to do that. And wear shoes. So snakes like to move around when they don't have to worry about predators. Like I said, they're in the middle of the food web. So other things like to eat them, especially birds of prey. And they're not a lot of birds of prey at night, most just owls, but um, they'll move around a lot more at night. So if you're out in your backyard, you know, go into the fire pit or whatever, just wear shoes. And make sure that you make some sound because if they're out there, they will skitter away and get out of your way and then you don't have to worry about it. But just, you know, be, be smart about that. There are no effective snake repellents. I know they sell stuff. I know they sell these contraptions that are supposed to emit supersonic vibrations that irritate things and make them go away. They don't. Um, don't put mothballs outside. There's a lot of chemicals in them that can actually contaminate your soil. They're just not very effective. So the, the premise behind that is that the scent, that snakes are very sensitive to the scent. And so they don't like that and they'll move away. Uh, don't do that. Not with mothballs, please. Don't use bird netting or sticky traps to try to eliminate snakes. You can see here, there's a picture of a snake that's gotten caught up in bird netting. Per, I've had a personal issue with the, I, I mean, I had some bird netting that I put up over some blueberries to try to keep the birds out when they were still young and not producing much. And I had a little, a little DK snake that got trapped in there. My cat actually alerted me to the fact that he was in there. He was so stuck in there. I had to cut him out. He was still alive. Uh, I was able to actually get him out and release him. But he probably would have died if it had been a few hours later because he would have been cooking in the sun. So please be very careful about the use of bird netting or sticky traps. I know the sticky traps are for rodents, but remember, they're attracted to the rodents. So he might be there for a meal and then he ends up dead. And that's not very good. Um, and just, you know, avoiding the interaction entirely. So when you see the snake, give it a second to move away. Uh, it's not going to take any more than probably 30 seconds and you won't see him after that. And then you don't have to worry about it. All right. We all remember, well, most of us probably remember Steve Irwin. Um, he was, you know, very entertaining to watch. He's probably one of the best poster children for what not to do with animals. I know he was a professional. Obviously he lost his life because of the stingray, but uh, he handled reptiles all the time. He got bit and there were, you know, a time or two, but this is nothing that anybody here should do. Um, bites are going to be much more likely if you are trying to mess with the snake. So if you have a stick and you're poking at the snake, trying to get it to move, it, it might bite you. If that's not a long stick, it may bite you. So just don't poke at it. Um, Relocation is better than killing, but just like with any other kind of animal, it doesn't ma matter if it's a, a mammal or a reptile you know, or an amphibian, when you relocate an animal out of its territory, it's lost and then in competition with other animals and it a lot of times ends up dead. So habitat modification is going to be most effective. The other thing I really, really want to point out, and it's highlighted here, it is illegal to kill non-venomous snakes in Georgia. Sorry, I'm missing the S on the end of snakes. I get a lot of calls from people and I get a lot of emails from people who say, my wife said, I had a copperhead in my yard. I needed to kill it. Can you please 
positively identify this copperhead for me. I can't tell you the number of times I have identified, I have never identified a dead copperhead. It's always, always been a non-venomous snake. Always. People just don't take the time to, to learn what the differences are between snakes. And so they end up killing a non-venomous snake that had no desire to be around it, uh, around that person. They just wanted to be off doing their own thing. Maybe they were in the garage because they had dog food and there were rodents in there and they were just trying to get a meal. They're not there to hurt you. Uh, always, always, always go for habitat modification. So if you have snakes in your garage or around your backyard, it is because you have snake habitat or food. Always, always, always. Okay. Either that or they're moving through because they're breeding and they're looking for love. That's another, <laughs> that's another story. Whoops. So avoiding negative interactions. We try to teach the IPM approach which is called the hurl model. So habitat modification or harassment, exclusion, repellence, and lethal control. Lethal is always the absolute last thing that you do when you have nuisance wildlife. These guys can fall under nuisance wildlife. I do have a QR code here. This is the only one in the whole presentation. It's a UGA publication on um, resolving nuisance wildlife conflicts. It's got a lot of good information. But so with snakes, habitat modification. So if you have a patio, just a big concrete patio, and you have snakes that are around, you probably have hollow areas underneath that patio. So the first thing you can do for habitat modification is go look. Look underneath to see if you have holes. Some animals will burrow underneath there. Sometimes it just washes out. Those snakes are looking for places, little burrows, places where they can go hole up. So if you fill those areas with soil or rocks or something else and you eliminate those burrows, what do they do? They move on. They go someplace else. Um, if you have tall grass in your backyard, they may hang out there. You may have voles and other small mammals that live out there. So that's going to be where the snakes hang out. Do you have a rock wall? Do you have a pile of old brush or tree limbs or something else? You get a lot of chipmunks and other small mammals and that live there. And those snakes will be there too. They'll be hanging around looking for a meal. So if you clean up those areas and you push them way back to the back of your property, the snakes move away too because the food moves away. The habitat moves away. Another is exclusion. So I recently had a phone call from somebody who said that they had um, rats in the attic and snakes, probably black snakes. So the snakes had, well, rats also had climbed up a conduit, an electrical conduit. And they'd use that as their little highway. So they were up in there just having a party in the attic. Good and bad because the snake was actually keeping the rodent population down. It could have been much worse. Rodents are very destructive. They'll chew on wiring. They'll chew on ductwork. Um, they leave lots of mess up and around in there. But those snakes were actually keeping the rodent population down. So that was a good thing. But this is where exclusion works, both for rodents and snakes. So you make sure you know and you figure out where are they coming into the house or the structure. And then you exclude them. You keep them out and you trap and remove them. Uh, so sometimes that might be, you know, a lethal trap or, you know, it may not. Just depends. Usually with snakes, they'll be removed and set free outside. Rodents, of course, are trapped. Repellents. So sometimes repellents work. It depends on the animal. Uh, this model is, like I said, generally used for nuisance wildlife of all types. So sometimes repellents work. And then lastly, if you have tried everything else and you cannot get rid of whatever it is that's a problem, then you can use lethal control. The problem with snakes is, is that a lot of people jump from H to L and they immediately go for the lethal control. I'm trying to tell you, don't do that. This is the whole point of, of why I'm here. I'm, I'm imploring you, please understand that these creatures are just there to live their lives. So you wanna appreciate them for what they are. Go for the first three first, and then if for whatever reason it won't go away after you've done all of that, I can almost guarantee you they will go away. They don't like humans. Then consider lethal control. And that goes for venomous snakes too. Maybe you've got a place down in the middle part of the, the, the state and you've got um, coral snakes or maybe you've got rattlesnakes. 
And they're kind of scary, yes, but remember, get rid of the habitat, get rid of the food source, spray them away, they move away. If there's nothing there to keep them, they will move as well. What do you do if you're bitten? Okay, so good point. You know, what do you do if you're out there in the garden and you reach under something and you get a snake bite? Well, you got to know, should I panic or should I not? Thankfully, we're in the metro area, so we have got pretty good medical attention around here. Uh, in this particular area, it's probably going to be a copperhead, of course. And like I said, be very careful in that early summertime when you have those young copperheads because they can't regulate when they they bite. Um, so know what it is. You really want to try to see what it is. Overwhelmingly, whether it's a venomous or non-venomous, you want to see that snake. And if you can, snap a picture if you can't identify it. But with a non-venomous, if you're pretty certain of that, Wash it with soap and water because you can get a bacterial infection. Um, and if you see the signs of infection, red streaks, that kind of thing, then um, make sure that you seek attention for that. It is a puncture wound. So you have to be careful of that. It can, it can push bacteria under the skin. Now, venomous, you want to, regardless of what type of snake it is, immediately seek medical attention. So some people... Um, and, I've seen everything and I've heard a lot say that you can suck that out of your skin. Don't do that. <laughs> I mean, maybe if you're out in the back country and you can't reach anywhere and you have no other choice but to try to cut it and suck out the poison, but do not do that here, please. Uh, snake bite kits, don't just don't do that. It can make things actually worse. So Benadryl does nothing. I know Sometimes veterinarians will suggest they don't know what bit the dog. Um, so sometimes they'll suggest Benadryl to keep the allergic reaction down, uh, but it does not work for humans and it really doesn't work for pets. It's kind of a feel better type situation, especially in pets. A lot of times they can actually make it through a bite from a copperhead, uh, but not, I mean, with a human, you really don't even want to try to deal with that. Just go to the doctor, go to the ER, and they'll use something called anti-venom. And what that's going to do is counteract and reduce the tissue damage. So depending on what type of snake it is will depend on the type of venom and how that um, reacts inside your body. Uh, usually it's going to be some type of tissue damage. It might be organ damage if it moves through your system, neurological. There's all sorts of bad things that can happen. So you want to just, if you can and you are in a place where you have a vehicle, burn rubber, just like this guy in the truck is, and get yourself to an ER stat. Uh, if you, you know, can call an ambulance, then you, you can do that. Otherwise, just, you know, get yourself to an ER so that don't go to an ur urgent care, get yourself to an ER. And they usually will have anti-venom um, if they have, you know, for that particular type of animal, you know, your snake that you're dealing with here, probably copperhead. But again, if you're up in the mountains, might also be um, rattlesnakes. All right. So now we're going to do some snake ID. So first and foremost, the venomous snakes, because these are the ones that everybody thinks that they have tons of in their yard. So these are all venomous snakes. You got the cotton mouth on the bottom, the coral snake, the copperhead, and then a uh, timber rattler. So cotton mouth. Uh, so you see here, we have a map that is called a distribution map. So if you're not familiar with how, uh, you know, wildlife, science works or fishery science works and you know also for plants as well you look at a distribution map so that is where you can find that animal um so the the darker or the gray area that is going to be where you're going to find that animal in georgia so you see georgia there and then of course there's a link if you wanted to go check that out that's actually um i'll have some resources at the back end of the the uh the program. But this is what these guys look like. So it looks a little bit like a water snake. It does. Um, but you can see here, their distribution map dips down. Uh, so probably like Peachtree City and then kind of down towards Macon. And then it shoots off towards South Carolina. So there are some of these guys up in the very far north eastern corner of the state up in the mountains. Uh, and there's a few here and there around there, but their main distribution is not anywhere in the metro area. 
So just know, you might see one. I can't, I'm not going to say they are not there. They might be there, but they really are not in, we are not in their, their uh, territory. Um, we just aren't. So you can see there's a dark band through the eye and they're very thick, kind of heavy bodied and they have a very kind of dull and dark pattern. So the, the ones that these guys get confused with quite often are water snakes. And I'll, I'll show you some differences between what a water snake looks like and what a, a cottonmouth looks like. They don't climb trees. They're not going to go after you. Uh, if they're in the water, they might. Uh, they are kind of cantankerous. But generally speaking, again, they really don't want anything at all to do with you. They just want to eat their fish. Uh, they're piscivorous, meaning that's generally what they eat. And they'll also eat some small amphibians. They don't want anything to do with you at all. Uh, it's They're considered a pit viper. So they will have the pits right here that's heat sensing because they're looking for their prey. But generally speaking, with vipers of all, they're going to have that slitted eye, kind of that cat eye. And they have those two pits for heating, the, uh, sensing the heat. They'll usually have a triangular head. There are some very characteristic things about venomous snakes that if you're close enough, and you don't have to be that close, sometimes if you're very curious, you can take a picture with your phone and zoom in. Um, but most non-venomous snakes will actually have a round pupil. So very different. And they don't have that triangular head. They'll have more of a rounded head. Copperheads. So you can see in this picture, this is a very clear picture of this copperhead. Uh, this is a juvenile. Uh, so you can see the clearly see the yellow tail tip here. He's a juvenile or she. They don't have a dark eye band. Copperheads go almost all the way down into the southern part of the state of Georgia, and they just cover a very wide distribution. The easiest way to tell these guys, they are usually very brightly colored. So you can see the guy below, he's got this characteristic kind of hourglass that we call it the Hershey's Kiss look. So if you look at him from the side, it looks like a Hershey's Kiss. They are generally pretty brilliantly colored. So it works really well, as if you remember back to that picture I showed you of him curled up in the leaf litter. It works very well for camouflage in the leaf litter. Um, but they're generally pretty thick, heavy bodied snakes. And they also have those um, heat sensing pits or the pit viper. And he will also have kind of a triangular head. So the slitted pupil, the triangular type head, the pits are the, for the, the heat sensing um, facial pits. Uh, and then if you happen across the juveniles, they'll also have this yellow tail tip. Eastern diamondback. So these guys are in the Southern part of the state. You're not going to find them up here unless somebody's brought one up uh, from the southern part of the state, which hopefully doesn't really happen. Uh, I have seen them in Mansfield area, so just know that that can happen. But that's the very, sometimes you'll get some crossover into areas that don't typically have them. But generally, this is their main distribution area. Uh, they are the largest rattlesnake in the world, very big. And um, you can see there the characteristic diamonds on their back. So it's a very, um, very characteristic pattern for these guys, hence the name Diamondback. They can swim. Sometimes you'll see them out in the ocean. Uh, I per I haven't, but um, they, they will do that. So you can see them along the coast there. They might swim on the barrier islands. And one thing to note is in the southern part of the state, we also have gopher tortoises. So Mansfield area, again, we have those down there. These guys will actually live in those burrows with the tortoises. They just kind of live together. They respect each other, I guess. So just be careful if you're out and about and, you know, you see a tortoise burrow because these guys might be in there too. And of course, they feed on small, manimal, small mammals. Um, populations are in decline, uh, much like a lot of other snakes, just through habitat destruction and um, and hunting. Timber rattlers. So these guys can be really found anywhere in Georgia. Uh, we don't see a lot of them around the metro area, and that's mostly because of human interactions. If you do see them, they're usually going to be killed, which is unfortunate. I do understand uh, most people, if you have kids, you know, pets, that kind of thing, they'd rather not 
have to deal with that. So though you see their territory is all over Georgia, just know there really aren't very many here just because they've pretty much been in, in, eliminated. So you will see decent populations up in the mountains and you will also see them down in rural central and Southern Georgia, but generally not very many in and around the metro area. Um, again, they have a pretty characteristic kind of zigzag pattern on their, on their, um, their skin. And they're again, pretty, they keep to themselves. They really don't want to be around you. Uh, they do hibernate and they will be in groups. A lot of times if you're up in the mountains, you might see uh, a, a den or a group of these guys together. And they're also in decline because of hunting and um, humans, unfortunately. Pygmies, these guys are fairly small. You also could see one of these, but probably not in and around this area. Uh, They're gonna be more southern part of the state, central, more rural areas up in the mountains, that kind of thing. They also use the, the burrows of gopher tortoises and, and mammals, other small mammals. So they just kind of uh, live in there. They'll feed on small lizards and frogs, things like that. They have no desire to be around you. 22 inches really is not that big, okay? Yeah, two feet, a little less than two feet. That's the maximum. So they're pretty small. Uh, and again, they do have that little rattle. So, but if you do see one, just give it wide berth and let it move on its way. Coral snakes. Um, so these guys are definitely down in the Southern part of the state. We don't have them up here. They are prefer to be where it's a little warmer, a little sandier. Uh, so the whole, you know, orange and and black step back, that kind of thing. Um, orange and yellow kill a fellow, not 100%. So just if there's one thing to know about snakes, it's that there is some difference in, in the morphology of the coloring of the snakes. And it is not 100% guaranteed that they will follow the rules for all the snakes of that particular species. So young snakes or juvenile snakes may be 100% different coloring than the adults. And even the adults may have some um, dimorphism, may have some differences in coloration. So just if you see them, give them wide berth, let them do their thing, let them move away. Uh, with venomous snakes, stick with the pupil, stick with the head, stick with the pit viper or the pits, um, those kinds of things. Just learn to, to tell them from a distance. But generally, these guys are going to live underground. That's what fossorial means. And um, they may curl their tip of their tail. So they don't have a rattle like rattlesnakes. But if you see one of these guys and he curls the tip of his tail, you might just want to turn around and walk away. But they're very secretive. They don't come running after you. Now, non-venomous snakes. I have a few more of those on here. I'll try to speed it up a bit. Mostly it's just these snakes. So we've got the northern water snake up at the top. Uh, I mentioned he gets uh, confused with the copper uh, copperhead and the water moccasin. And you can see he does have the markings on his back, but his head is vastly different. DK's brown snake, tiny. That's a quarter. That is an adult snake. Uh, your eastern racer, they're kind of interesting. Rough green snake. Uh, your hog nose, they're kind of fun. Uh, and then the rat snake. The rat snakes are the ones that we have, again, are mostly around us. So rat snakes, there's several different types, and they're usually three to five feet. You've got the black rat, the gray rat, the yellow rat, um, and then you've got some interbreeding between them. Rat snakes look way different when they're juveniles versus adults. They eat a lot of um, rodents. They're really good climbers. These are the guys that live around our houses. So um, sometimes it's kind of fun. I don't have a picture here of one. All well, actually, that one there, you can kind of see he's kinked up. Um, some of them may get this. They look like a zigzag. If they feel threatened, uh, like the hog nose will flip over and, and pretend like it's dead. These guys get all zigzaggy up. It's kind of funny. And then they'll run away. Uh, they may shake their tail. 
they may emit this noxious musk, uh, but generally speaking, they're just trying to get you to leave them alone. And they eat mice and rats and birds and eggs. Sometimes chicken owners complain about these guys because they'll come in and they'll take an egg, but they're also good because they're eating rodents. Almost always you'll have some type of a rodent issue in and around your chicken house. Losing a few eggs is always preferable to having rats in and around your chicken house. So a lot of chicken owners appreciate them and will let them have an egg or two and um, eat the, the rest of the rodents that are in and around there. Corn snakes, uh, these guys are part of the pet trade. Uh, they should all be at this point uh, bred in captivity. However, there are still some that are taken from the wild. They're kind of a brilliant color. So orange, reddish, brown, gray. Uh, you have a, like a checkered belly, which is kind of interesting. They can be pretty long, up to four feet. And they're really kind of small, slender snakes. They're You can handle them pretty easily. And, um, you know, they eat mice, that kind of thing. So they are active. Um, at all hours, but mostly nighttime, especially when it's really super hot out. You can find these guys all over Georgia. Black Racer. These guys are funny. Um, you can see down at the bottom, I've got the little, little arrow. They do this behavior called periscoping. So like you have a um, submarine that has the periscope that comes up, they'll do the same thing. So every so often you'll see funnies where you have a snake that's popped up out of a deck or maybe in a bush or here he's in the grass. That's very characteristic black racer behavior. And it's called periscoping. It's kind of interesting. They just kind of stick up and they'll move their head around and look around for stuff. And then they'll go back down and then they'll slither away. They eat little lizards and insects and small snakes, birds, things like that. And, um, you know, they're just all over Georgia. So not very big, um, really as compared to some, but pretty slender also. So they're just kind of neat, neat little snakes. They can get confused with the with the rat snakes often, uh, but these guys usually move pretty quick. So if it's there and then it's not, it may be one of these guys. Brown snakes. Uh, so these are really small, uh, less than a foot long, but most of them are probably going to be closer to the six inches. So very, very tiny. Sometimes they'll hang out in your um, mulch piles. So if you're digging mulch around and you get one of these little guys and they kind of slither away, that's the maximum size. They don't get very big. There's different color morphs. So as I mentioned with snakes, they can be all sorts of different colors. They don't follow the rules. So yellowish, reddish, kind of a gray brown. Um, sometimes you'll get different types of spots, but generally on these guys, a couple rows of dark spots down their back and um, they'll have a dark streak on their head. They like I said, hang out in leaf litter and around logs and stuff and in mulch piles. So just be careful when you're scooping your mulch. Uh, they're all over Georgia, but they typically will eat slugs and worms and things like that. So they're going to be in and around your, your garden. And they're a good thing to have because they're eating a lot of the stuff that can cause damage to your plants. Garter snake, um, two feet or so or less, pretty small. And they can bite. I played with one when I was a kid one time. I had it as a pet for a while and it bit me and I was sad and I let it go. Uh, they're pretty characteristic. If they've got these little ribbons uh, markings and then kind of a checkerboard marking on them, um, they'll eat worms and slugs and things. And these guys, because of what they eat, it's a good thing. You want them in the garden. So have them around, give them places where they can hang out and uh, they can be pretty much anywhere in Georgia. The brown water snake. This is one of the ones that gets confused with the copperheads and also with the cotton mouths. So these guys we do have in and around the metro area. They're water snakes, so they're going to be hanging around streams, creeks, ponds, um, rivers, that kind of thing. And they're not going to be very far from the water's edge. Most of the time they're going to eat whatever happens to be in and around that pond. Uh, they are very good climbers, so you might see them in a branch of a tree like the guy below. They're very good swimmers, and, um, you know, they, they unfortunately do get confused with cotton mouse a lot. But you can see here, I've got a close-up of the head. He has the round pupil. He also has kind of a slender, almost oval head, 
and he doesn't have the pits. They do have nostrils, but he does not have those pits for sensing heat. So if you see one of these guys, it's probably a water snake. Just let him be. It's probably not a copperhead or a cotton mouth. Um, usually cotton mouth is what they're confused with. Northern water snake. Um, here's some, these guys sometimes have a little bit more brilliant coloring than the uh, other type. So you can see here, I've got the differences between a copperhead and a northern water snake. The pupil, probably the biggest thing to tell. Uh, you've got um, the reverse hourglass shaped. So if you think of a Hershey's kiss pattern on a copperhead and just kind of get that into your head, think it's the reverse or flipped for a water snake. So if it's flipped, if it's an upside down Hershey's kiss, that's your indication it's not a venomous snake. They have a round head because they are not venomous and they have round pupils. So remember, a venomous snake's always gonna have those cat eye pupils. And um, these guys just eat fish and amphibians, other things like that. Uh, they don't really wanna be around you and they will run away as fast as they possibly can. One thing that um, if you ever watch Dirty Jobs, there's an episode where Mike Rose up in Michigan, I think, and he's out with a graduate student. They're collecting these guys so they can do a population assessment. They can bite because remember, they're feeding on amphibians and fish. They have teeth. Um, it's a really hilarious episode if you can find it on YouTube. Uh, he, he gets bit man, he must have gotten bit 60 times, but it is absolutely hilarious because he's catching all of these water snakes to put them in a bag. It just still makes me chuckle even when I'm thinking about it now. All right, banded water snake. Uh, so you can see the belly here is a little different and there's a difference between the banded, you can see that down there and the cotton mouth, which has a much more geometric kind of pattern on it. Doesn't have the Hershey's kisses like the copperhead does and these guys are you know up to four feet give or take but they're pretty heavy uh, fairly heavy bodied and um again just fish amphibians that kind of thing so um they're in the southern part of the state you're probably not going to see them here unless you've got some property down there but uh again look at that pupil look at the shape of the head and that usually will tell you that you have nothing to worry about green water snake lots of water snakes don't have very many of these here, just a little bit along um, the Florida border and a little bit along coastal, the coastal border in South Carolina. Um, confused often with the cotton mouse, but even here you can see that this guy has a round, kind of a roundish ovally head and uh, the, the pupil uh, just doesn't really look like one. Red bellied, these guys see these a lot in ponds and in or near freshwater. Again, they eat fish, amphibians, and uh, interesting, they'll flee to land unlike a lot of other water snakes. So sometimes they're confused with uh, land, land type snakes, but they are a water snake. And then the king snake, we see a lot of these uh, declining populations, but uh, eating a lot of snakes, lizard, these guys will eat copperheads. So if you see one of them twisting around a copperhead, that's it's supposed to be doing it. They're resistant to viper, pit viper venom. They'll eat pit, pit vipers. Hognose, these are the drama queens. Trying to rush it, I've <laughs> got a few more to go. Uh, they will puff themselves out and play dead. And it's hilarious if you've ever seen one. Uh, I've got in here drama noodle. Uh, sometimes called puff adders, but definitely they are not, uh, they're not harmful at all. They almost never bite. They eat a lot of little mammals and birds and vertebrates, that kind of thing. And they're immune to the, some of the poisonous toads, uh, cane break toads that you can get. Those actually are, are poisonous. Um, poisonous meaning if you eat it, you're going to get sick because it's poisonous versus venomous, which it's injecting its, its venom into it to kill. Um, so the, the, Toads actually exude a poison, which, you know, if you get it on your skin, you can actually have some issues with it. But uh, these guys can eat that. And the southern hognose. So fossorial, meaning they live in a burrow and hardly ever bite. They're very dr dramatic, not quite as dramatic as the eastern, but uh, very dramatic. Most of these guys are going to be in the southern part of the state. Ringneck, these are little guys. 
10 inches. Uh, I find them around my house almost all the time. Like every summer I'll find some and they just eat little smaller snakes, DK's snake, which is a very tiny one. Uh, this is one of the few instances where the adult and the juvenile will have that ring around its neck. It's very characteristic. So um, easy to tell what these guys are. Red bellies, Again, very easy to tell what these guys are. They're very small. You'll find them in mulch piles a lot of times. Uh, they'll flip. You see that red on their belly. Hey, they're a good snake. They're eating those slugs and, and other bugs and things like that. Um, and that's basically it. So some resources for you guys. I've got the herpetology program. You can look up all sorts of information about all those different snakes there. Uh, Facebook has got some excellent groups that you can join for snake ID. I personally will use them. I'm not 100% on all my snakes because like I said, there's a lot of variation in coloration and between juvenile and adult. And we get a lot of, of photos from folks that have killed it. So it may be missing its head. Uh, so I'll go off and go there. There's a lot of herpetologists that have a lot of expertise and are happy to show you how to um, identify and, and tell you what it is, that kind of thing. If you do get bit, there's the National Snake Bite Support Group, or if you have a pet that gets bit, you can go there. And if you want to learn a little bit more amphibians and reptiles in Georgia, this is a good book by John B. Jensen um, and a couple other authors. And with that, that's, um, that's my information. So if you have questions, you can reach out to me there. Uh, this particular presentation will be posted on the Metro Master Gardener YouTube channel. And uh, you can go there and, and take a look at it if you're interested. Um, let's see if I've got any questions here. Yay for snakes, such a misunderstood critter. Yes, definitely. Uh, we see lots of copperheads in the area, especially baby copperheads. Yes, be very careful. I know I mentioned that many, many times uh, about the habitat and about making sure that uh, if you do have baby copperheads and it is that season, always be careful about where you're poking your hands. Uh, get yourself some sticks to keep around. And a couple of years ago, someone visited my bluebird box and ate the eggs. Uh, yes, yeah, snakes can be, I mean, they're predators just like anything else. And so, um, yeah, that can be a problem. And that's part of the circle of life, I guess. I know people get upset about that when they put the bluebird boxes up or any, any, you know, birdhouse really. And you get a snake that comes in there and, and eats the young, uh, either the eggs or the young and, and, you know, I'm, I know. It happens. Um, let's see. Found remnant eggshells. Uh, let's see. Snake repellent. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, the snake may have moved on too. So um, it may or may not be the repellent. Most repellents aren't, re don't really work. Snakes will generally have a rather large territory. So they'll move around within that territory. And really they're not that large themselves. So um, he may, he or she may have just moved on within its territory. Um, are Scottish Terriers the only dogs that will eat snakes? That I'm not sure. I do know that there are lots of dogs that are out there that get themselves into trouble and get bitten because they get, they're harassing the snakes. So as for eating the snakes, yeah, I would imagine you could probably have any dog that's a little too curious that gets out there and, and may eat the snakes. So uh, I don't know for 100%. I do know there are other types of dogs that will dig and um, are go to ground dogs. And sometimes they come across snakes. Uh, I've got a friend that has a Jack Russell or had a Jack Russell and had all sorts of problems with that. That dog got bit quite a few quite often by snakes. Uh, thankfully, they are don't need um, the antivenom the way humans do, so, or as much. Uh, always lots of snakes in the summer in the straw around blueberries. You do have to be careful when walking around picking berries. Yes, you do. Anytime you have straw or mulch, someplace where rodents might like to go, like voles, you're going to probably have snakes. Uh, it's a habitat thing also if they're using it for cover 
to move from one area to the other. Remember, they are part of the food web. They're smack in the middle. So there are things that want to eat them. They too are looking for cover to move from one place to the other when they're looking for food. Uh, I am so glad to have the facts and the odds of encountering a venomous snake and how to be safe precautions. Yes, um, thank you. That's awesome. That is exactly what I wanted people to to kind of take away from this, that they learn some new stuff about snakes and they're a little less scary. Some of those, um, some of those Facebook groups that I put up there, uh, let's see if I can go backwards. Yeah, the Wild Snakes Education Discussion. That's an excellent one. Uh, you can go there and learn all about stuff. Sometimes they'll put little quizzes up like they'll put 10 snakes and, and say, identify whether this is venomous or non-venomous. And you get pretty good at it. And it gives you an appreciation for snakes so that you can understand they're part of nature and good to have around. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you got some stuff out. What's the best repellent around chickens? Um, so again, I mentioned chickens. And they're usually there because there's a food source, whether they're coming for the eggs or whether they're coming for the rodents that are hanging around that are eating the chicken food that's being cast on the ground by messy chickens. You know, I don't know. Your best thing is exclusion and keeping them out of the, the nest boxes. But honestly, that's hard to do. A lot of times they're black snakes and they come in and they'll take an egg and then, you know, they, they head off. Obviously, if you have chicks, they will eat those. They're opportunistic. But um, generally speaking, if you have adult birds, they're not going to go after an adult chicken. They're only going to go after the chicks or the eggs or any rodents that happen to be around there. Uh, so you have to be careful. You can't really put any toxins out for them. Uh, but you can ex try to exclude them from the, the hen house so that they can't get access in there. And of course, you can always pick them up and, and move them away. But there are a lot of chicken owners that are happy to have them because they eat the rodents. Um, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. And did you say pets don't need as much antivenomous? So generally with dogs, uh, there's not a severe reaction. Uh, a lot of times dogs will get bit in the face because they're harassing the snake and the snake can't get away. So yes, they do usually get treatment, but it's not as severe as with humans. Humans have a much stronger reaction. I guess, to snake bite, to a venomous snake bite. And obviously if it's a non-venomous snake, it's not going to be an issue. Uh, but generally speaking, yes, dogs don't have a severe reaction to a snake bite. All right, is there are there any other questions? All right, uh, well, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I guess that's about it. So if I don't have any other questions, thank you all for coming. And I hope you all have a good night. Take care.